Hey guys, so we're ready to start the third book of the Undead Pet series with Sam Hay as the author and Simon Cooper as the illustrator. The author is the person who writes the book and the illustrator is the person who illustrates the book with illustrations, which is just a fancy word for what? Drawings, pictures, okay? All right, so are we ready to get started? So this is chapter one, book three. Night of the Howling Hound. The story so far. 10-year-old Joe Edmonds is desperate for a pet, but his mom's allergies mean that he's got no chance. Then Charlie, his great uncle, gives him an ancient Egyptian amulet that he claims will grant Joe a single wish. But instead of getting a pet, Joe becomes the protector of undead pets. He is bound by the amulet to solve the problems of zombie pets so they can pass peacefully to the afterlife. And so the trouble begins. So does my trouble when I drop the book. Chapter one, thwack. Joe gave the tent peg a thump with the mallet, then tugged the rope to make sure it was secure. Awesome, said Matt, pegging in the other side. Looks like we're the first to finish. They were at the Wolf Sleep Activity Center on the edge of Brockton Forest for a school camping trip. Not even a tornado would shift this thing, said Ben, poking his head out of the tent. As he spoke, the wind picked up and a cloud. Whoops, hold on guys, I skipped a page. Let's go back. But just then, a tornado did shift it. A tornado in the shape of Bradley Piker, or Spiker as he was known. He raced over and hurled himself at the side of the tent, making it bulge inward. Hey! yelled Joe. Watch it! Says who? This is my tent too, said Spiker. I'm with you guys tonight. What? Joe groaned. He really didn't want to share a tent with Spiker. He was the biggest troublemaker in class. Yep, Mr. Hill says I'm with you. I hope you're not going to wet your pants and call for your mommy when it gets dark tonight, Joe Edmonds. Joe shot him a dirty look. Especially if the wolf starts howling, Spiker said with a smirk. The ghost wolf of Brockton Forest. Yeah, yeah, Joe said. I know. Hundreds of years ago, a wolf escaped from some hunters by leaping off some rocks. As he spoke, he glanced over Spiker's shoulder and noticed a jagged rock face just above the tree line. But don't forget the best part. After it escaped, Spiker said in a spooky voice, the wolf came back and stalked the hunters, catching them one by one, ripping out their throats and crunching their bones. Matt grinned, you made that bit up. And people say, added Spiker, his voice dropping to a ghoulish whisper, that you can still hear the ghost of the wolf howling in the woods at night. As he spoke, the wind picked up and a cloud drifted over the afternoon sun, darkening the sky. Joe shivered. After all the weird stuff he'd seen, thanks to Uncle Charlie's Egyptian amulet, 
he could easily imagine a ghost wolf lurking in the forest, watching and waiting. Hey, you guys, came a shout. If you finish setting up your tent, I need some volunteers to help collect firewood. It was Lizzie, one of the camp counselors. She was small and wiry with short red hair. According to their teacher, Miss Bruce, she was a champion rock climber. Come on, it'll be dark before we get the fire going. By the time they had built the fire, the counselors had prepared a campfire dinner. I'm starving, said Joe, sitting down next to Matt with a peck plate piled high with franks and beans. There were 20 children from Joe's class there, along with Miss Bruce and the principal, Mr. Hill. They sat together on logs, arranged in a circle around the fire, digging into their dinner. As Joe shoveled in his last spoonful of beans, he heard a strange noise in the distance. ow took a bite of hot dog and shrugged. I didn't hear anything. Oh, listen, there it is again. Joe peered out, but it was getting dark and he couldn't see. It's coming from over there. Matt stopped eating for a second and listened. Then he smiled impishly. You're hearing things, Joe. Maybe all the talk of ghosts is freaking you out a bit. But before Joe could reply, Mr. Hill blew a whistle to get the class's attention. When everyone's finished eating, I want you all to help clean up. You kids over there, he said, pointing to Joe, Matt, and a few others. Collect the plates, and that group over there, you'll be doing the dishes tonight. There were groans from the dishwashing group, but Mr. Hill went on. You're going to be swapping jobs tomorrow night. Remember... Camping is all about teamwork, and everyone has to help. I remember when my wife and I went camping with friends in the Appalachian Mountains. Everyone pitched in, especially when the blizzard started. Cho and Matt grinned at each other and rolled their eyes. Mr. Hill had already spent the entire bus ride boring the class silly with stories about his camping adventures. And now he was starting another one. They quickly stacked the dirty dishes and carried them to the sinks. Want to hear a ghost story, Ben said, turning on his flashlight and putting it under his chin so that his face lit up like a ghoul. It was a dark, stormy night, and a group of kids were camping in a creepy forest. Ow! Hey, Joe interrupted. Did you hear that? Not again, Matt snorted. What is it this time, Joe? Another ghosty? No, it sounds like an animal howling. A ghost wolf, said Matt. Yeah, yeah, very funny, Joe. Let's go take a look, said Joe. Come on. What, now? Ben glanced at the trees. In the dark? Joe nodded. Why not? I'm in, grinned Matt. What about you, Ben? Definitely. Joe pulled his flashlight out of his pocket. Head for the tents, he whispered. Everyone will think we've gone to get something. Then we can double back to the trees. As they walked into the forest, the darkness closed in. There was a distant rumble of thunder. This way, whispered Joe, heading for a path he had spotted earlier. He flashed his flashlight left and right, the beam catching movements in the bushes. Did you see that rat? Yeah, it was massive, breathed Matt. As they went deeper into the woods, the trees grew denser and the undergrowth thicker. There was no light from the moon. Joe's heart beat faster. This was how Uncle Charlie must feel 
when he set off on an expedition. And that's the guys walking out into the forest at night. There was another rumble of thunder, closer this time, and Joe heard the howling again, followed by the sound of twigs breaking and bushes being pushed aside. Something crashed through the underbrush. I think it's over there, Joe hissed, flashing his beam at the bushes. Spread out! Matt moved off to the left. Ben headed right, their flashlight beams bouncing around the trees. After a few minutes, Matt called back. Did you see anything? No! Ben shouted. Their voices were much farther away than Joe expected. He was just about to call them when there was a sudden crack of lightning and he saw a shape lunging toward him, its sharp teeth flashing white. It crashed into him, sending him flying. He gasped, <gasps> waiting for the wolf to lock him in its jaws and sink its fangs into him. And that, my friends, is the end of chapter one of Night of the Howling Hound, okay? So, I want us to think about our plot mountain. So, we have been working on our plot mountain in class, right? And as I read book three, we're going to go through the plot mountain, okay? So our first part of our plot mountain is going to be our exposition. And do you guys remember what the exposition has in it? What's the exposition made of? It's made of the setting and the setting has two things, where and when. And then the exposition is also tells us who the characters are. Okay, and we are going to start talking about main characters and supporting characters. Okay, so we're gonna talk about main and supporting. So our main characters influence the story. They change the story somehow. And our supporting characters, they just help the story. They make it more interesting. Okay, all right, so I will be back with chapter two can't wait to be reading to you again. Love you guys.